11, Luke chapter 11. Where are we going to be this evening? Luke 11. We'll start reading in verse number 39. It says, And the Lord said unto him, This is a Pharisee, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Uh, ye fools, do not he that made... Let me start that again. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the law of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Lord, help us to learn some things tonight. I pray that you would speak to our hearts about uh, some important uh, truths and issues found in this passage of Scripture. I pray that you'd use it in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here the uh, Lord is talking to a group of uh, Pharisees who had gathered, uh, in a, particularly in a Pharisee's home. And he was speaking to them, and the man had invited him to come, and so he did. Um, I find it interesting that verse number 45, this is kind of like the um, the... Dumbest question you could ask. Okay, so verse 45. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou uh, reproachest us also. So here the lawyer, uh, after hearing the Lord um, uh, rebuke and uh, tell the Pharisees how bad they were, a lawyer comes up and said, are you going to insult us too? Why would you do that? <laughs> You know that he's going to not speak very nicely of you if you're a bad person. So anyway, he comes up and uh, asks this question, and the Lord does proceed to uh, rebuke him as well. But anyway, we're going to focus on, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, we're going to focus on verses 39 to 44 this evening. But uh, we know the Pharisees were religious leaders of that time who made a show of spirituality. And um, yet they were called hypocrites again and again by the Lord. Now, we, there's a lot we can learn here from uh, the hypocrites that we find in this passage, the Pharisees. And uh, we obviously need to apply these things, make sure that we are not uh, falling into the same traps and having the same um, personalities or uh, traits that the uh, Pharisees are having in our lives as well. The, he pointed out some very interesting problems with these leaders. First of all, I want you to see that they were thieves and wicked they were thieves and wicked. Notice down there, verse number 39, The Lord said unto them, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening, ravening, and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But notice verse number 41, this is where we get the idea that they were thieves and wicked, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. Now, before I talk about this, let me just mention, first of all, the Lord calls them fools here. Now, this is not uh, a contradiction of biblical truth in the sense that Jesus himself said you should not call somebody a fool. He was speaking uh, here in the true biblical sense of the term. But uh, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about fools. And uh, there's uh, many characteristics of fools, but in Scripture, fools... Uh, were often used uh, to describe somebody that was a wicked or depraved person, one who acts contrary to sound wisdom in his moral deportment, one who follows his own inclinations, who prefers trifling and temporary pleasures to the service of God and eternal happiness. That really does describe um, the, uh, the Pharisees at the time. Um, putting it in the uh, pretty, pretty close to uh, modern terminology, if you will. Ben Franklin, uh, one of our founding fathers, said this. He said, The learned fool writes his nonsense in better language than the unlearned, but still, tis nonsense. 
And uh, that's the way the uh, Pharisees always acted. Uh, when people looked at them, they were like, why are you doing that? Why are you acting that way? People knew that they were acting in a foolish manner. But you could really, um, you could really boil down the concept or the truth about a fool uh, basically in this statement. That is somebody who is unwise. Somebody who uh, has trouble discerning what is right and what is wrong, basically is what a wise person does. But here Jesus describes them as fools, and I think many times we as people can fall into the trap that uh, we are uh, considering ourselves to be better in many ways than we really are, or that we are just fine and uh, we really can't see past the nose on our face, uh, in a sense that what we're doing is actually not okay. Um, Probably the worst deception out there is when we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're fine. Uh, the Bible talks about that in the book of James, uh, that we should not deceive our own selves. But that's what the Pharisees were doing. And anybody who deceives themselves into thinking that they are just fine when in reality they're not, the Bible, I think, accurately calls them a fool because they are unwise. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were like here. Well, what exactly are we referring to? Well, first of all, the outside looked good, but the inside was full of filth. The outside was good, but the inside was full of filth. We'll talk about some more specifics about this here in a few minutes. But uh, the outside does make a difference. Did you know that? A lot of times we think, well, God looks on the heart, but it doesn't matter what, what, what the outside looks, what looks like. Well, that's not necessarily true because what people see is the outside. They see what we wear. They see how we, how we act, where we go, what we do, what we listen to. That's what people see. They can't see our hearts. So the outside does make a difference. And uh, Jesus uh, did point that out. Uh, notice he says in verse number 40, Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also, indicating that both of them are important? So the outward appearance does have something uh, of importance. We should look good on the outside. We should dress properly. We should uh, look our absolute best and we should represent the Lord as we should. And the Pharisees were not good at doing that. But the filth on the inside was not just bad thoughts. That's oftentimes what we think of when we talk about being on the inside and bad thoughts. It actually was bad actions as well. See, they were getting full on the backs of others which is indicated by that verse uh, 41 where it says, but rather give alms of such things as ye have. The reason they had so many things was because they were taking it from other people. They were stealing it from them. They would pillage homes so they could benefit from it. Uh, what is interesting is that Christ was brutally honest with a man who he was dining with. Here he was sitting in a Pharisee's home, one of these people who are one of the greatest offenders, and he was telling him, hey, look, everything that you have here is a result of your thievery. Now, that's a nice way to be a house guest, isn't it? You're a thief! <laughs> well, that's exactly what he was saying to them. Uh, you think, everybody thinks that you're just rich and a nice person, when in reality you're full of filth. You're an awful kind of a guy because you're a thief! Well, that's what the Pharisees were like. They had invited Jesus to eat, but Christ came with the purpose of confronting this man with his wicked heart, <clears throat> and he pointed out his means of getting gain. When people are this way, they can act as pious as they want, but people know the truth. Do you think the people out there in the community knew that the Pharisees were robbing them? or taking uh, their money, taking their possessions and things like that, all under the guise of religion? Do you think that that was the case? Well, absolutely, sure. You know, a lot of times we think, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to go act this way or whatever, and nobody will ever know. Well, wrong, wrong. People can tell. Uh, there's, always the, um, there's always the truth that is written all over your face in the way that you act. People can tell when there's a problem with somebody, and uh, what we need to do is obviously what, God, what Christ says here, and that is to repent. He says, go and give your alms to those who are in need. In other words, give back what you've stolen. Even though they had acquired much of their possessions through thievery, they could give it back and thus show that they were repentant. We too need to 
repent of our wicked hearts and get rid of the certain things that make us wicked. Be right with the Lord and go forward and do right. So here the Lord was saying that uh, they were clean on the outside, but everybody knew that they were actually wicked and filthy on the inside. Secondly, here in this passage, we see Christ tells them to not overlook the spirit of the law. Notice down there in verse number 42, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you, for ye, tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the law of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Now this is interesting. Um, there are some people out there, and they're good people, and uh, I'm not intending to bash or bang anybody over the head about this, but uh, they will say that there's nothing in the New Testament that says that we should tithe. Well, actually, that's not true. Because right here in this passage of Scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ says that they should have done it. Notice, read it again. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe, there it is, okay, mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the law of God. Now notice it says, these, referring to the judgment and the love of God, ought ye have done, and not to leave the other undone. Okay, so he's saying, you need to do it all. You need to tithe, yes, but you also need to uh, not pass over the judgment and the law of God. So everything needs to be done. Um, now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about tithing, but uh, we know here that the tenth of what they possess, right down to the plants in their homes, he knows that they should give that. And Christ commands, uh, commends them for this action. He says, look, I'm glad you're doing that. I'm glad you're tithing. But these ought ye to have done, but you also should not have left the other undone as well. So, uh, he was clearly teaching the concept of tithing here, but also then he tells them to not pass over judgment and the law of God. You know, it's good, it's important for us to carry out the commands of our Lord. We should. The Bible tells us that if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, if any man love me, uh, he will keep my commandments, and so on. It's mentioned many times throughout the New Testament that if we love the Lord, if we want to do what God wants us to do, if we want to be successful as a Christian, then we should do His commandments, keep His commandments. That's obvious. But we should do so with the right heart and the right spirit. And it's found here, pass, don't pass over judgment and the law of God. We should be able to discern what is right and what is wrong, and we should be able to do so in love, in love. Um, I mentioned this in my Sunday school class. I don't, I don't know why I end up rehashing certain things in the Sunday school uh, that I uh, end up doing the evening service. But um, standards and rules um, that we have in our homes should be accompanied by spirituality. Um, this is so very, very important. I think a lot of times that we just say, you know, this is the way it's going to be. This is what you need to do, kid. Do it. And we don't actually love and we don't actually give spiritual reasons why we do certain things. And as a result, a lot of times kids will be turned off by that. They'll, they'll get themselves in trouble. They'll reject what we're trying to accomplish in their lives and the uh, standards and rules that we're trying to, to apply. And they'll say, I don't, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, well, there must be some spirituality there accompanying that, uh, the idea of, of rules and regulations. Uh, now, sometimes we have to look at it and say, okay, am I being impractical here? Is this something that's just crazy? Should I, should I reconsider this or think about it again? Should I uh, perhaps uh, loosen up here or there? And, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's not contrary to Scripture. Uh, but we should ultimately... Uh, be combining spirituality with our standards. Standards and convictions are important. They're, they're vital. They're essential to um, the Christian life, to being successful as believers. We need to have them. Um, and when you are involved in an institution, we're involved in a home or whatever, um, we need to abide by the standards that are given to us. Now, certainly we can uh, ask why we do certain things, perhaps, as long as it's in the right spirit or uh, atmosphere or whatever. And there's been times where I've, uh, I've wondered about something. I didn't 
necessarily uh, go against it, but I said, so why do we do this in particular? Why, why do we do this a certain way or whatever? And it's not that I'm trying to be unkind or just trying to figure out. And sometimes it's because, well, back several years ago, we had this problem, you know, or whatever. And, uh, and, and that's the reason for the rule or something. Um, and that's, that's okay. That's fine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go against that. Uh, but many times we as believers will just say, this is what we're going to do. And you just do it. Well, you can do that when kids are little, but when they get a little bit older, it's time to explain why we do certain things, why you do certain things in your home. But just to carry out traditions because it's a tradition um, are, are many times not understandable per, for people and oftentimes seem like unnecessary weights if it's not done in a spiritual atmosphere or with a spiritual attitude. So asking the Lord to help as many times the way it should be done. I tell you, there, there's one place in um, there, there's one place that I really think has um, mastered this, if you will. I'm sure they still have trouble, uh, but uh, the Bill Rice Ranch is really good at this. And I'm not just saying this because she's sitting down here because they work for the ranch in the summer times. But um, my wife and I have commented about this several times. They, they do have some pretty um, strict rules, I guess you could say, about dress issues. And uh, they want the ladies to look modest and everything. And, and it's good. I think it's fine. I agree with them wholeheartedly. And uh, those are the standards that we have in our home. But the way they handle it is, to me, very refreshing. Because they don't, like, hammer people over the head with it. They don't beat you up if you don't do it. They just simply say, look, um, this is what we're going to do. We ask you to abide by it. If not, we'll, we'll come up and talk to you and, and nicely ask you to change or whatever. Uh, but if you could just help us out. Hey, look, we don't want to don't have, wanna have trouble. You, we want you to enjoy yourselves and we want to enjoy ourselves and make this a great week for everybody. So just please do what we ask. I mean, it's that simple. And they don't do it in, a, in an unkind, uh, caustic way. They just ask nicely. Uh, what they're doing is combining love with their spirituality. And as a result, it works. It works just fine. And uh, we never um, hear of any issues like that while we're there. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure they have problems, but uh, we don't hear of anything like that because they handle it, I think, in a loving, spiritual manner. And so many times I think we get ourselves into trouble because we're not uh, many times handling things in a spiritual way. And we just say, this is what we're going to do, bowl in the china shop. And uh, instead of explaining things biblically uh, and helping people understand uh, we, get to, we get ourselves into trouble by doing that. And I'm, I'm not saying us necessarily as an institution. I'm saying lots of times as parents and um, uh, people in authority, that's what happens. So what the Lord was saying here was make sure that you abide by the rules, the standards that you have, but do so with love and with wisdom. Have some judgment about it. Thirdly, I want you to see Christ reprimands them for their pride. Verse, uh, verse number 43. Woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Now, um, I guess you could say it would be similar to uh, I perhaps what we have here. We have seats in the uppermost places. These seats right here. I'm just kidding. That's not what we're referring to here. Uh, but uh, if you were a Pharisee, this is, this is where you would like to sit. Okay? The Pharisee would love to sit up, and we don't sit up here because of that reason. Don't get me wrong. That's not why Pastor and I sit up here. It's just for convenience sake. Uh, if we sat down there, it would be just fine too. But um, let's just say you're a Pharisee, and uh, when you walk into the church building, the first place you would look would be right here. And this is the seat that you would want to have. And you would want to sit there so everybody could look at you, not so they could say, wow, that man is spiritual. <laughs> wow, how fantastic they are. No, no, no. They would look at that. They would sit there so people could look at them and uh, think about how important that their position was. That was the idea. Um, and Christ was saying, that's what you love to do. You love the most important positions. They had the highest seats. Matthew 25, uh, 23, verse 5 says this, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their flactories and enlarge the borders of their garments. 
and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi, or master. They loved it when people would talk to them. They loved it when people would consider them to be very important in their position. Um, there are certain places in the world today that uh, elevate people in positions of religious leadership uh, unnecessarily. I'm thinking of a pastor that I know. Uh, he was a missionary to, um, I believe, over Tahiti, over in that area, that region of the world. And uh, back uh, uh, in, the, in the 1900s, there was a great movement, a missionary movement, and uh, the congregational uh, religion, uh, you can call it that, because they're not uh, much of anything today. But the congregationalists, so they went into that area, and there was a great revival, great awakening, and they saw a lot of people get saved, and many churches were planted over there. Well, as a result of that, uh, the churches became dominant, or predominant, if you will, in the community. And uh, those people that had positions of leadership in the, in the uh, churches there were elevated uh, within the community. And actually, the pastors there now make uh, two to three times more than the average worker makes uh, there in those communities. We're talking the average person makes $30,000 and the uh, pastors make $70,000, $75,000. And uh, people just have uh, put them up on a pedestal. And as a result, the churches are, are failing. They're, they're, uh, they're nothing now. They're, they're liberal. They're, they're way off the deep end. But people have elevated them unnecessarily. There's other communities as well, other places where you can think of where uh, religious uh, leaders have uh, put themselves up, if you will, in their position. Look, I'm all for uh, paying people what they're worth. I really am. Um, the Bible says that the laborer is worthy of his hire. It says also, though, it also says those that uh, live of the gospel or preach of the gospel should live of the gospel. So um, I'm all for paying people what they're worth, all right, as long as they're doing their job. But um, if they're not reaching into the community and things like that, then uh, all they're doing is wanting position, and that's not okay. There's a movement that I'm thinking of right now where um, uh, Pastor and I could probably live comfortably if we wanted to. All we'd have to do is go and apply, and we could uh, have a really nice salary, a, a vehicle to drive around, a very nice car, a house, and everything, and it would be all paid for by this organization. Um, and uh, everything would be just fine and hunky-dory for the rest of our lives. We would be just fine. But we're not going to do that. We're going to live dirt poor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, no, 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 there's an organization that's like that. Uh, but basically they have elevated people to, or, or pastors and leaders to positions of uh, important positions when in reality they shouldn't be that way. Um, they love it when people walk up to them and say, Woo, you are a very important person. And they think they're a very important person when in reality they're not. And uh, so he says that they love the most important positions, but he also says that they love the greetings that people would give them. Sometimes people love it when they treat them as important. This is, again, a pride issue. And the Pharisees were given the position that they didn't deserve uh, because they left certain things out. Um, in fact, they would uh, love it when people thought that they were more spiritual than they really are. Uh, the other passage I read there in Matthew chapter 23, it says, The greetings in the market and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. In other words, Master, you are an important individual. You know things uh, from the Bible. Have you ever been around somebody that considered themselves to be uh, a biblical expert when in reality they're not? To be perfectly honest with you, there are no humans on the face of the planet that are biblical experts. Now there are some people that know more than other people, but there's no experts. The reason is because the Bible is an inexhaustible book. 
and you can you can study it and write about it and learn and listen to preaching for the rest of your life every single day every single minute for the rest of your life and you will never ever exhaust what's in the bible never ever do so so there are really no experts out there if you want to call them that when it comes to the bible um, now, again, there may be people that know more than others, and I respect them, but have you ever been around somebody that thought they knew more than they really did? You ever been really around somebody like that? I have. I know I have. Uh, I remember one time I used to work on a golf course, and uh, it was a fun job. I enjoyed it. I just drove around and mowed lawns all day, basically, and occasionally I'd have to get out and take a weed eater and weed eat a pond, but... Uh, um, it was a fun job. It was great. I enjoyed it. Uh, but I had a guy that worked with me and uh, got to golf for free, by the way, which was fun. But uh, anyway, there was a guy there that uh, I got to work with and uh, he was a, um, I would call um, him, him a, either an unbeliever or a, a very baby Christian. Now, he, he didn't exactly know a whole lot. And uh, we were sitting there talking one day, just sitting on the cart, and I was trying to witness to him a little bit. And he said, yeah, I've uh, I go to church and I'm I'm I've been I've been saved and he said I I've been studying through the book of First Corinthians. I tell you, the book of First Corinthians is absolutely my favorite book in the Bible. I said, oh really? That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. First uh, Corinthians is a good book. There's a lot in there about First Corinthians. I said, uh, but what other books have you read in the Bible? He said, um, well, that's actually the only one. <laughs> So here he was trying to tell me how spiritual and good he was, and he hadn't read any other books but 1 Corinthians. Now, there's obviously a whole lot more in the Bible than 1 Corinthians, but uh, there are people like that. He was trying to convey to me that he was knowledgeable when he really wasn't. And uh, there's a lot of things in 1 Corinthians, if you don't read it in, in the context of the rest of Scripture, you're going to be awful confused. Uh, you're going to walk away leaving a lot of question marks in your mind about certain things. But sometimes people will come across as though they have figured out some truths from the Word of God uh, that are only understood by God. Have you ever come across somebody like this? They have it figured out. They know exactly why and how that they can reconcile certain parts of Scripture with certain other parts of Scripture. Um, they have figured out the idea that... Um, that God is sovereign and uh, that, um, you know, there's, uh, that man has a human will, but they've decided, they've figured out how uh, God can reconcile both of those things and uh, they figured out exactly how he's done it. Well, I don't think that we can. That's a mystery to some degree. Why? Uh, I think a mystery, uh, another mystery would be uh, why God would come to earth and die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Why would he do that? Uh, why are we still here today? There are lots of questions that we have about Scripture that uh, we will never know the answer to until we get to heaven. But there are some people that have figured it out. They really have. And what Jesus is saying here is, look, don't be like those people because they haven't figured things out. Basically, you are being more proud uh, or you're being proud and you shouldn't be. There aren't people that know more than the Lord does, certainly, and not more than other people. Uh, number four, Christ reprimanded them directly for their hypocrisy. Now he calls them hypocrites. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Now, a hypocrite, uh, by definition, is somebody who is an actor. An actor. Um, if we were going to have a play up here on stage, uh, those people that were acting in the play would be a bunch of hypocrites in the true sense of the word. Uh, because that's what hypocrite means, literally, an actor. Now, obviously, we wouldn't be using that in a derogatory sense when referring to actors, but uh, that is what a hypocrite is, someone who is portraying a character. In other words, they're acting like someone that they're not. That's the point of it. Now, some of them, 
I believe the Pharisees here, I believe some of them were not even believers. Uh, they were acting like they were when in reality they were not. There is always that possibility in a Christian setting. There may be somebody in here tonight who uh, has made everybody think that they're called Christian when in reality they're not. They're beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they're dead as a doornail, spiritually. Like what he says there, For ye are as graves which appear not. And the men that walk over them are not aware of them. People walk around you every day. They're with you every single day. They see you. They, they, they talk to you. And you act like you're a Christian when in reality you're not. Hypocrites. You're acting like something that you're not. Now, this could be a direct reference to salvation. Um, or it could be a reference to something else. But obviously the solution to this is if you're not saved, then quit acting like you are and get saved. That's the point. But some of the Pharisees were definitely believers, but they were dead spiritually. They were dead spiritually. When people saw them, they seemed to be spiritually minded, but in reality they could care less about the things of God. Now, I can't see your heart. And you can't see mine. So there could be some of us here that perhaps get tired of the things of the Lord. Perhaps get tired of listening to sermons. You're tired of coming to church. Tired of going to prayer meetings. You don't enjoy them. You don't participate in soul winning because you don't think it actually works. You're basically spiritually dead. I sure hope that's not the case with anybody. But that's a direct result of somebody who is involved in sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages or the payment of sin is death. Spiritually, spiritual death. Romans chapter 6 is a passage of scripture directed mainly toward believers. Now we know that if somebody sins, that they spiritually will die. We know that. But that could, uh, that's not just confined to people that are unsaved. That could also include people who are saved as well. Did you know that you can be spiritually dead? As a believer, you can be. Now, there will be some people that will say, you know what, if somebody's spiritually dead, then that means that they're not really a believer. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that because I think I'm a living example of that. <laughs> I was somebody who was uh, anti, um, you know, a lot of different things when it came to spiritual matters. And when I was living a sinful, selfish life, I didn't care about the things of God. I wasn't somebody who was interested in, uh, you know, hearing a lot of sermons. I wasn't interested in, in um, going out soul winning and, and telling people about the Lord. I wasn't interested in reading my Bible every day. I wasn't interested in going to prayer meetings. I wasn't interested in that sort of thing. I was more interested in pleasing my flesh. But God convinced me that I was saved and that my problem was that I needed to get right with God. And let me tell you, as soon as I got right with the Lord and I surrendered my heart to Him, guess what happened? All of these spiritual things came to life again. You know what I experienced was revival, which is what life, that's what revival is. It's life again. But when I surrendered to the Lord and said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I will go wherever you want me to go. I will stop living a life that pleases the flesh. God immediately transformed my life. And he gave me spiritual life again. Now, there may be somebody in here, you've been saved, you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, you have put your faith and trust in Christ, you know that, 100%. But you're not living right. You're not living a life that's pleasing to the Lord. You're not living a life that's surrendered to Him. You know what, there is going to be some spiritual deadness there. There will be. Because the wages of sin is death. It always is. And you will sense this spiritual dullness or deadness 
Well, let me tell you, since I've surrendered to the Lord, I have experienced it as well. There's been many times where I've experienced the spiritual dullness in my life. It's not that I needed to get saved again. It's not that I needed to um, totally surrender my life. I just needed to get right with God about some things. There, is, there has been that spiritual deadness. I, I, I can see it. Why? Because the Bible is clear about the fact that the wages of sin is death. Spiritually, we die. Now, God can always bring us back to life again. We can always have that relationship with him restored and renewed. And that's the wonderful thing about uh, the uh, Christian life. While you live, while you are still alive, God can still use you. As long as you surrender your life to God, God can still use you. You are not totally lost, totally hopeless, totally, completely gone. God can still use you. And that's the wonderful, encouraging part about the Christian life. So my encouragement to you this evening is, get right with the Lord. If you're not saved, if you're a walking dead person, spiritually, in other words, you are on your way to a Christless eternity in hell, separated from God forever and ever, then you know what you need to do is get saved. You need to take that important step of faith tonight. Maybe there is somebody in here. I think some of the sad, one of the saddest passages in Scripture that I can read is in the book of Matthew where it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful works, and thy name cast out devils. Then will I uh, profess unto them, Depart from me, I never knew you, ye workers of iniquity. And those people will be cast into outer darkness forever and ever. Cast into hell forever, for all eternity. For some of the saddest words in the Bible, I, I certainly hope there's nobody in here tonight would hear the words, depart from me. But at the same time, we as believers need to have some spiritual life. If we're not surrendered and walking in the Spirit every single day, then there is going to be that deadness there. If we walk after the flesh and not after the Spirit, if we please ourselves instead of pleasing the Lord, that's exactly what's going to happen. So here we learn some important things about the, spirit, uh, the uh, Pharisees. They were certainly uh, good examples for us not to be, <laughs> really found in Scripture here. And the Lord was pretty pointed about it, but he was making some very, very uh, wonderful applications to us as believers today. Let's make sure that we are not hypocrites in any way, shape, or form. Let's bow our heads in prayer, can we?